This is WBCQ, bringing world's last chance radio to you from Monticello, Maine, USA. Violent crime, political unrest, financial instability. Everything points to an impending crisis, a crisis like no other. Tune in to World's Last Chance Radio to learn how you can spiritually prepare for what lies ahead. WLC Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's imminent return. So today's teaching is going to be from Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12 at our local congregation, um, which I would love to be teaching at right now, but we're doing our part, our small part, to try to stifle uh, the virus that's going around. So um, we're just offering these online services for now. Um, Hopefully we'll be back together in a few weeks. That's my prayer. Um, but in our local congregation, I've been teaching on Exodus 12, and I've been teaching on the Passover. I think I had gotten up to like four sermons on the Passover, and then in the last sermon that I taught here from my home, or from my barn, <laughs> which is where I'm at right now, um, I had taught on the second Passover to try to explain some of the things that we were we were doing. So I want to get back to Exodus chapter 12. And I'm going to teach on verses 7 through 13 today. I don't have a fancy method of teaching. I just usually teach verse by verse and explain the verses as I go. But I would like to read Exodus 12, beginning at verse 1, and go through verse uh, 13. And then we'll backtrack to 7 through 13, verse by verse. So, Exodus 12, verse 1 says, Yahweh said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month is to be... The beginning of months for you, it is the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, they must each select an animal of the flock according to their father's households, one animal per household. If the household is too small for a whole animal, that person and the neighbor nearest his house are to select one based on the combined number of people. You should apportion the animal according to what each person will eat. You must have an unblemished animal, a year-old male. You may take it from either the sheep or the goats. You are to keep it until the 14th day of this month, and the whole assembly of the community of Israel will slaughter the animals at twilight. Now, I've taught on Exodus 11.1 all the way through Exodus 12, verse 6, and you can actually watch those teachings on YouTube, on my YouTube channel, Ministers of the New Covenant. Today we're picking it up in verse 7. In verse 7, it says, They must take some of the blood and put it on the doorpost and the lintel of the houses in which they eat them. And obviously this is talking about the Passover animal, the sheep or the goat that was slaughtered or sacrificed for the Passover. The reason that the blood was to be placed on the doorpost, if we continue to read in chapter 12, was it was a distinguishing mark. I think we'll actually get to that in verse 13. It was a, a distinguishing mark on the doorpost and the lintel of the house. So the, the upper post and the two side posts of the house. And the lamb's blood was a distinguishing mark so that when Yahweh passed over the houses, as he says that he would, he would not allow the destroyer, I think the Aramaic Targum says the destroying angel, to enter into the house and slay the firstborn male in that home. So this was something that took place specifically at the very first Passover. Now, a lot of people don't understand this, but we slaughter a lamb for Passover. And I know a lot of people have a problem with that, and I have sermons on that explaining why we do that and um, how that there's nothing wrong with doing that um, in this day and time. But a lot of people get real edgy about that. Um, 
And they even get more edgy when they find out that I have always done this with my children. Um, we actually do put lamb's blood on our doorposts and our lintel. It's not because we think that Yahweh is still passing over homes or that the destroying angel is going to come in and slaughter our firstborn son. But we do it as an object lesson. We do it to remind the children how that the very first Passover took place. So we're going to find out as we go through these verses that Passover is a memorial. It's bringing something to remembrance. And I feel that when we start saying that, well, we don't have to do that part, or, well, we don't have to do that part, well, we don't really have to worry about the shoes on the feet or the staff in the hand, well, you don't really have to eat it in a hurry, ah, don't worry about the lamb's blood, you strip, slowly strip away these object lessons, uh, not just for the children, but also for the adults, and you forget how the very first Passover took place. But when you include all of these ordinances and statutes into the Passover, you remember not just by reading, but you remember by enacting, acting out that first Passover to the best of your ability. Obviously, none of us are without flaw, but we do our best to serve Yahweh um, in all of His commandments. Uh, so, yes, that's something we do. Um, and we teach our children, look, this is what was done that first Passover uh, that night. Verse 8 says, they are to eat the meat that night. Um, I talked about this in a previous sermon, how that I believe the Passover was slaughtered on the afternoon portion of the 14th day of Abib, and then was eaten that night, which I believe moved into the 15th day. The Passover was eaten, as we're going to see, with unleavened bread and bitter herbs, the reason it was eaten with unleavened bread is, is the Passover meal was the meal that kick-started or jumped off the feast of unleavened bread for seven days. So the meat was eaten that night. I believe that was the beginning of the 15th day of Abib. As I believe that all Sabbaths are observed from evening to evening. As Leviticus 23, verse, I believe it's verse 32 says, uh, Sabbaths, plural, uh, both in the Hebrew text and also in the Septuagint. Um, a lot of English Bibles will say Sabbath singular, but the Hebrew and the Septuagint read the plural there. So, uh, they are to eat the meat that night. They should eat it roasted over the fire along with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Um, the unleavened bread comes about because, as you see later in the chapter, the Israelites were thrust out of Egypt. Once Yahweh passed over the houses in the middle of the nighttime, and all the firstborn males in the land of Egypt died. Everyone that didn't have the blood of the lamb on their doorpost and little died. Um, even, the, even the firstborn cattle. From the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on the throne all the way to the firstborn of the prisoner in the dungeon or the servant girl grinding the meal at the millstone. Um, no matter highest in the land or lowest in the land or even animals, all of the firstborn males died. And there was a great cry in Egypt such as never had been before and never will be again. And so there was fear that came upon uh, the Egyptians and they were giving their, their goods, their silver and their gold goods and jewelry away to the Israelites. So they thrust them out and they had to leave in a hurry. And um, Exodus chapter 12 and another place talks about, uh, let me see if I can find it. Exodus 12 verse 33 talks about this and this is in dealing with the unleavened bread said, Now the Egyptians pressured the people in order to send them quickly out of the country, for they said, We're all going to die. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, with their kneading bowls wrapped up in their clothes on their shoulders. And then if you move down to verse 39, it says, The people baked the dough they had brought out of Egypt into unleavened loaves, since it had no yeast. For when they had been driven out of Egypt, they could not delay and had not prepared any provisions for themselves. And so that's the reason for the unleavened bread is it, it takes long. It, it's, they, didn't have, they didn't have bread machines, which even with a bread machine, you know, it might take a couple hours to make a loaf of bread or a few hours. They didn't have bread machines and then they have Fleischmann's yeast packets that they could just throw in the bread machine to mix in with the dough. Um, it was a process of kneading, uh, letting the dough rise, um, sometimes getting a, a starter yeast from the, the air outside and placing your dough outside and, and letting the yeast spores from the air get mixed in with the dough and letting that dough rise and then taking it back in and kneading it some more. It's a big, long process 
to make a risen loaf of bread. But you can make a, a flat bread a lot quicker. You can make it fast. And so that was to be eaten with the lamb, and the lamb was to be roasted over fire. And it was also to be eaten with bitter herbs, uh, possibly to uh, later throughout the years remind the Israelites of the time of bitterness in the land of Egypt. Do not eat any of it raw, verse 9, or cooked in boiling water, but only roasted over fire its head as well as its legs and inner organs. I think the King James there in verse 9 says, and pertinence thereof. Um, uh, uh, some uh, translations, I think, might even translate it as the intestines. Later on, some commentators talk about that it was a Jewish tradition, actually, to remove the intestines and to wash them, clean them and wash them thoroughly, and then place them back into the Passover lamb. Um, I don't think that that's what Yahweh's talking about. I think that the HCSB gets it right here and that he's talking about the inner organs. I don't think he's talking about the guts of the animal, but the inner organs like the kidneys, the heart, uh, the liver, so forth and so on. And the animal was to be roasted whole, um, let's see, its head and its legs uh, roasted over fire. You were not to eat the animal raw and you were not to boil it in water. These are some of the other statutes. Verse 10, do not let any of it remain until morning. You must burn up any part of it that does remain until morning. And so on, on the surface level, these two commandments sound like they might be contradictory, but what Yahweh is saying is, as he said up beforehand in verse uh, 4, that if your household is too small for the whole animal that you are sacrificing the year old male, sheep or goat, then you invite your neighbors that serve Yahweh and they can eat the animal with you. Um, so what I think Yahweh is saying is do your best to eat all of the meat. Don't let any of the meat go to waste. But any part of it that does remain, any meat that does remain that you can't eat, you burn that up, obviously, along with the other remains of uh, the animal. That's verse 10. Verse 11. Here is how you must eat it. Dressed for travel. Your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand. You are to eat it in a hurry. It is Yahweh's Passover. Here is how you must eat it. Dress for travel. Literally, that means with your loins girded. Some translations say with the belt on your waist. Not an exactly good translation, but loins girded. And Back in the... Um, these times, the times of the Exodus, the Hebrews and, and a lot of Middle Eastern people, the men especially, would gird up their loins when they were going to have to run a long distance or go into battle. And what that meant is they would take their, their long robe that they had or their longer tunic that they had, usually from anywhere from the knee to the ankle, and they would, they would kind of gird that up around their waist to where it came up above their knee and then they would tie it up to where they could move and, and, and have a, a lot of flexibility. Um, some people even say they might have girded it up in between their legs, pulled it up, and then maybe tied it in a knot. So it was kind of like a, a pair of pantaloons or something like that. That was called girding up the loins. And, and what that signified was you were ready for battle or you were ready for travel. You were ready to, to move. You weren't um, somewhere relaxing or you weren't somewhere casual. You were ready to move. So dress for travel is, is a good understanding of that, but literally it's to, with your loins girded. Uh, your sandals on your feet. Obviously, you, you're ready to go. Sandals are on the feet. Um, and your staff in your hand. The staff was a, a staple of, of travel uh, for, the, for the Israelites back then. The staff was used... Uh, to to aid in walking um, and also sometimes to ward off uh, predators or wild animals. Um, you are to eat it in a hurry, eat it in haste. Um, this is why I believe that the Israelites did not wait until morning in the sense of daylight or sunrise. Um, I believe they left in the middle of the night after Yahweh passed over the houses and the plague was finished there in the land of Egypt. There's another passage in here that talks about mourning, and I'll probably get to it, but let me just touch on it briefly. It is in verse, looking at my notes, it's, it's in verse 20, 22. 
22 says, Take a cluster of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and brush the lintel and the two doorposts with some of the blood in the basin. None of you may go out of the door of his house until morning. Now, in my early years of keeping the Passover, and remember, I believe in performing all of the statutes and ordinances to do an imitation of that very first Passover so that when you're teaching your children how it was done, they're they're not just listening to you tell them, they're actually enacting that Passover out. And so we would ever, whatever house we took the Passover in, we would we would stay the night and we'd wake up at daylight the next morning and then we would leave. And I would use this passage and I would actually tell people part of the commandment is to stay in your house until the morning time. As I begin to progress in my understanding, I, I, I never got to the point where I didn't obey that commandment, but I had a what I believe is a better understanding of that commandment in that the Israelites were eating the Passover meal at nighttime. They were dressed for travel, loins girded, sandals on the feet, staff in the hand, eating it in a hurry. And the reason was is because once Yahweh passed over the homes in the middle of the night, then after that they would be thrust out, as verse 33 says, the Egyptians pressured the people to send them out quickly. And I believe they were released from, from that bondage, at least the beginning of that release, took place on Passover night, which I believe was, was the 15th, the, the first night of unleavened bread. That was, in one sense of the Hebrew word boker, or the English word morning, that was early in the morning. Um, the Hebrews used the word morning in this way, the same way that we do now here in America. Um, somebody may say, uh, did you get a lot of sleep last night, Matthew? And I may say, well, you know, no, I've been up since 3 o'clock this morning. Now, obviously, when I use the word morning, nobody looks at me like I'm dumb when I use it that way. They know that I'm using it in, in a, another sense of the word, that I don't mean morning like at dawn or at sunrise. I mean early in the morning, uh, the last watch of the night, uh, so to speak. Um, the Hebrews used the word morning this way, I believe in this case, which makes much more sense as to why they were dressed for travel, because once the middle of the night passed by, and it was early in the morning, still dark outside, but early in the morning, they would have to be leaving Egypt. Um, I'm not going to go to these, because I will in a later message, but um, in the book of Ruth, Ruth, she got up from Boaz's feet um, early in the morning before anybody could see her. Um, in the Gospel of Mark, Yeshua, he would go out in the while it was still dark, early in the morning, to pray. Um, the women arrived at the tomb in John, John's Gospel, I believe it's the 20th chapter. Uh, they arrived in the tomb early in the morning while it was yet dark, uh, that Gospel says. And then, of course, you have the uh, four watches of the night um, in regards to Roman time in the New Testament. And you have three watches of the night, I believe, um, in the Old Testament. And that last watch of the night is called the morning watch because it's early in the morning. So I think that's what it's saying when it says don't let any of it remain until morning. It's talking about um, when, you, when you're when you leaving in the middle of the night, early in the morning, um, and burn up any part of it that does remain uh, until the morning. That's when the lamb is burnt, and then that's when the Israelites uh, were to get out of Dodge, so to speak. That makes sense with eating in a hurry. Eating it fast. Does it make sense to eat it fast if you're going to be in the house all night and then at dawn or sunrise, then you finally leave? That doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Um, it is Yahweh's Passover. What is Yahweh's Passover? Sometimes we, we, we call the passing over of Yahweh over the house as the Passover, and that's not wrong. But I think it is Yahweh's Passover is specifically in reference to the Lamb. The Lamb itself is the Passover. Um, in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 5, it says, For the Messiah, our Passover has been sacrificed for us. And the Greek word there is uh, pasha. Um, it doesn't use a Greek word for lamb there because the, simply the word pasha or uh, the Hebrew word pesach automatically implies the, the lamb or the goat for the sacrifice. Uh, if you just back up a little bit to verse 8, once again, let's focus on the word, it is Yahweh's Passover in verse 11. Look at verse 8. They are to eat the meat that night. They should eat it. Eat what? The lamb. Verse 9. Do not eat any of it, the lamb, raw or cooked in boiling water, but only roast it over fire, its head, as well as its legs. 
Verse 10, do not let any of it remain until morning. You must burn up any part of it that does remain until morning. Here is how you must eat it. You are to eat it in a hurry. It is Yahweh's Passover. The lamb itself was the Pesach or the Passover. Verse 12, I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night. This is, this is Yahweh still speaking to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt. Back in verse 1 he says that, I, speaking of Yahweh, I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and strike every firstborn male in the land of Egypt, both man and animal. I am Yahweh. I will execute judgments against all the Elohim of Egypt. Now this is an interesting point here. And I don't have notes in front of me. I'm, I'm doing all this off of my head and with a few notes that I have in my Bible. Yahweh is going to pass through the land of Egypt. He's going to execute judgments on all the gods or the Elohim of Egypt. Now, this is one of those passages where I think that the word gods of Egypt or Elohim, Elohim of Egypt, it has to be something more than just an idol. Now, I recognize that idols were representative of different heathen deities or different heathen Elohim. I believe that. I, I, I understand that. And I believe that an idol is nothing. I mean, there's cases where idols got knocked over or beaten. I, I think about Jeremiah 10. It says that idols are like a scarecrow in a cucumber patch. They can't do evil and they can't do good. It's just an inan inanimate object. Inanimate objects um, are not uh, inherent sinfully or righteously. They're just an object. Okay. So I, I recognize that. Um, but it doesn't make sense here for gods of Egypt to only be talking about idols. He's going to execute judgment on idols? You know, what, what kind of power is that? Um, unless, unless there are deities, Elohim, gods, behind those idols that the Egyptians would bow down to, worship, and use as representatives of who they served. And I think that that's the case. And, and I'm of the persuasion that these are real gods, these are real Elohim, and they stem from certain bad angels or fallen angels that left their first habitation in heaven. Uh, not all of the angels. A lot of the angels stayed with Yahweh and are still with Yahweh to this day and still serving Him and doing what Yahweh would have them to do. But I believe that some of the angels fell from that first habitation and they became, uh, I don't want to go into a whole lot of detail here and get on a, a, a rabbit trail, but uh, they became uh, false gods, uh, demonic forces, um, demonic activity and powers um, in heaven and on the earth. Um, I don't believe that they're at the same level as Yahweh, and as we know in the book of Job that even Satan himself um, must get permission from Yahweh uh, to do certain things. So um, I'm just saying that when it says that Yahweh is going to execute judgment on the gods of Egypt, I believe it's saying that Yahweh is going to show that he has more power than, than the Elohim or the gods, the real gods that the Egyptians serve, the demonic powers and demonic activities and forces. Um, hopefully I didn't get too far off on a rabbit trail with that. Um, verse 13 is our last verse for today. The blood on the houses where you are staying will be a distinguishing mark for you. The blood on the houses where you are staying. The lintel, the doorposts. Yahweh says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No plague will be among you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. The blood on the doorpost was a distinguishing mark. Now, I just mentioned earlier about how in the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians 5, the Apostle Paul says that the Messiah, our Pesach, or Pasha, Passover, has been sacrificed. And Yeshua is the antitypical lamb. It's not that he's a lamb with four legs and was sacrificed by a priest or anything like that. It's simply a word picture. It's an, it's an antitype. How that Yeshua is a fulfillment. He is a reality of the Pesach in the land of Egypt. And how that the blood of Yeshua is a distinguishing mark spiritually now for us whereby Yahweh 
Yahweh passes over us and judgment doesn't come upon us in, in our home. Um, I think that that's beautiful when you understand the, the, the type and the anti-type here in the Scriptures. But this was the difference. Uh, uh, Yahweh didn't peek through the windows or have the destroying angel peek through the windows and see who was an Israelite or an Egyptian or a heathen or a slave or um, a part of the mixed multitude or something like that. That, that, that had nothing to do uh, with Yahweh saving you or destroying you. What saved or destroyed you was one thing, the blood of the Lamb. And I'll close with that today, is that uh, this is the natural Passover, um, and Yeshua, the Messiah, is our spiritual Passover. And that is the one thing that will cause you to be saved by Almighty Yahweh is if you have the distinguishing mark of the blood of Yeshua, which simply means that you believe in the work that Yeshua did for us. In His life, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension to the right hand of Yahweh. Um, you have, if you believe that, uh, you have that distinguishing mark um, on the spiritual doorpost and lintel of, uh, of your life. Um, doesn't matter where you've come from. It doesn't matter what your last name is. It doesn't matter what color your skin is or your eyes, color your eyes are. Uh, you are a person. And uh, if you repent of your sins and trust in the means of salvation that Yahweh gave to us, His Messiah, His Anointed One, His Son, he, he will forgive you of all of your sins and transgressions. We learn so much when we study the Passover. Um, and I don't believe that uh, the spiritual aspect negates the natural. I believe that Yeshua is our Passover, but I don't think that, that, that negates the natural no more than spiritual rest negates us needing natural rest or no more than Yahweh being our spiritual father in heaven negates us having to honor our natural father. That's all for today. Um, blessed new moon, first new moon of the year to everybody. I'll pick this up next week. What day of the week is it? I'm, I'm losing track with everything going on. I think it's Wednesday. And so next, uh, our next Sabbath on the lunar calendar um, will be on uh, next Wednesday. We'll go from Tuesday evening to Wednesday evening. But I'll have another teaching on uh, Wednesday evening and we'll just continue in Exodus chapter 12 verse by verse we'll pick it up in verse 14 Talk probably I think the next few verses are going to talk about um, removing the leaven and the seven days of unleavened bread and um, the memorial day uh, the feast, the first day of the feast of unleavened bread and things like that and then the seventh day and I believe a little bit differently than some people do on that but uh, anyhow we'll pick this back up next week I appreciate you for uh, watching and especially if you're part of the local congregation, um, I miss you. Brother Matthew loves you. You are in my mind always and in my prayers every day from the oldest down to the youngest. And I cannot wait to see everybody again and have a good time fellowshipping and worshiping Yahweh. So may Yahweh be praised in the name of the Holy Child, Yeshua. Shalom. See you next time. This is Jane Lamb with your daily promise from Yah's Word. An unexpected phone call in the wee hours of the morning is every parent's worst nightmare, but that's exactly what happened to Jim and his wife Julie. A stranger's voice informed them that their son, Jay, on a camping trip with friends, had been gravely injured. Apparently, the young men had heard deer moving about above their campground and decided to go take a look. For whatever reason, Jay was carrying a .22 calibre handgun one of his friends had brought. While hiking up to see the deer, Jay had slipped and dropped the gun. The gun then discharged, a bullet hitting Jay. Although .22 calibre guns aren't powerful, 
the location of the injury was serious. The bullet entered Jay's groin, missing the femoral artery by just a few millimetres. If the artery had been severed, Jay would have bled out and died within minutes. As it was, the young men had a long, bumpy drive to get out to a main road where they could call for help. Even so, the nearest hospital was 45 minutes away. Jim called the hospital requesting that his son be transported on to Denver, a larger city where he believed Jay could receive better care. We don't have time for that, the surgeon replied. We need to do a workup and operate immediately or we might lose him. Jim and Julie were a two and a half hour drive away. They drove as fast as they dared, praying all the way. They arrived at the hospital just as Jay was being wheeled out of surgery. The road to complete recovery might be long, but he was going to make it. Jim and Julie felt as though their hearts were bursting with gratitude. First thing, they decided to call their daughter, Jessica, who was in India to let her know what was happening. It was difficult getting through to her, but when Jessica finally came to the phone, she was crying. Is Jay dead? she asked. Jim was shocked, wondering how she could have known the danger her brother had been in. Jessica explained that a few days before, she'd received a strong impression that her brother was going to die. She had asked all her friends to join her in praying for his protection. Jim hastily reassured his daughter that her brother, though injured, was fine and would make a full recovery. Dad, a tearful Jessica said, it was our prayers and the hand of Yah that stopped that bullet. In Jeremiah chapter 32 verse 27, Yahweh says, Behold, I am Yahweh, the Eloah of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? We've been given great and precious promises. Go and start claiming. Yahweh is one. Yahushua, the Christ, is his only begotten human son. Contrary to popular belief, Scripture does not teach that Christ is the Creator, that the Father and the Son are the same being, or that Yahushua existed prior to his birth in Bethlehem. Sadly, many beautiful and beloved brothers and sisters in the faith today have been deceived by tradition, and have allowed the erroneous doctrine of a pre-incarnate Christ to cloud their understanding of Scripture. In this video, we will ask some very important questions pertaining to this teaching, questions that Trinitarians and Binitarians simply cannot answer without contradicting Scripture. It is our hope that, as you prayerfully contemplate these questions, you will lay aside all assumptions, preconceived ideas and cherished traditions. It is our humble admonition that you will allow the Bible alone to shape your understanding and frame your conclusions. Let's begin. Question 1. If the Father and the Son are literally the same being, how can the Father be beyond temptation while the Son is not? Scripture says plainly that Yahweh cannot be tempted. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by Yahweh, for Yahweh cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Scripture is equally clear that Yahushua was tempted, and he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. Therefore in all things he, Yahushua, had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to Yahweh, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Question 2. 
if the Father and the Son are literally the same being, how can the Father know the timing of Yahushua's return while Yahushua himself does not? Isn't it nonsensical to suggest that the Father is keeping secrets from himself? But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Question 3. Yahweh is immortal and cannot die. Yahushua, however, died. He willingly laid down his life for you and me. If the Father and the Son are literally the same being, how is this possible? Yahweh is immortal. I urge you in the sight of Yahweh who gives life to all things, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honour and everlasting power. Amen. Yahushua, however, died. And Yahushua cried out again with a loud voice, and yielded up his spirit. But Yahweh demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For to this end Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. To suggest that the Father and Son are in actuality one being makes a mockery of the crucifixion and reduces it to a charade. Clinging to the ideology that Yahushua is Yahweh demands that you also believe Yahushua only feigned death because he was still alive in heaven. Please pause for a moment to think about the ramifications of such a doctrine. This is irrefutably a denial of the gospel message. Question 4. If the Father and the Son are literally the same being, why does Yahushua say that Yahweh created mankind? Why did he not say that he created mankind? And Yahushua answered and said to them, Because of the hardness of your heart he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of the creation Yahweh made them male and female. This was a remarkable opportunity for Yahushua to let everyone know that he was the creator if he wished to do so. He doesn't, though. He never made such a claim. Question 5. If the Father and the Son are literally the same being, why does Yahushua continually refer to his Father as a separate being? Now if Yahuwah so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? And shall Yahuwah not avenge his own elect, who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? Question 6. If the Father and the Son are literally the same being, why does Yahushua repeatedly refer to Yahuwah as his God? Does Yahuwah have a God? And about the ninth hour, Yahushua cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yahushua said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren, and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. It is critical to note that Yahushua not only refers to Yahuwah as his God, but emphasizes that Yahuwah is the only true God, separate and distinct from himself. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Yahushua the Christ, whom you have sent. Question 7. If the Father and the Son are literally the same being, why does Yahushua pray to the Father? Is he praying to himself? At that time Yahushua answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent, and have revealed them to babes. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Question 8. If the Father and the Son are literally the same being, 
Why does Scripture distinctly say that it is Yahushua that will judge humanity and not the Father? How can the same entity both judge and not judge at the same time? For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. Truly, these times of ignorance Yahweh overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Question 9. If the Father and the Son are literally the same being, why does Yahushua repeatedly refer to Yahweh as his Father? Is Yahushua his own Father? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And I bestow upon you a kingdom, just as my Father bestowed one upon me. But Yahushua answered them, My Father has been working until now, and I have been working. Question 10. If the Father and the Son are literally the same being, why does Yahushua repeatedly refer to himself as the Son of Yahuwah? Is Yahuwah his own Son? For Yahuwah so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For Yahuwah did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of Yahuwah. Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Yahushua answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Did you get that? Peter declared Yahushua to be the Son of the living God. He did not say that Yahushua is the living God. The question naturally arises then, how and when did Yahushua become the Son of Yahuwah? Scripture answers this question in plain language. Listen to Gabriel's explanation to Mary. And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also, that the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of Yahuwah. Yahushua became the son of Yahuwah when he was conceived in Mary's womb through the overshadowing power of the Holy Spirit. Yahuwah's immutable word, conceived in the virgin's womb, literally became flesh. It was this miraculous event that the psalmist prophesied about almost 1,000 years earlier. Yahushua, the promised Messiah, the descendant of David and heir to the throne, was to be literally begotten at a finite point in time. I will declare the decree. Yahuwah has said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Scripture does not teach that Yahushua pre-existed in heaven before condescending to become a human fetus. This is a human invention which cannot be substantiated by the Bible. Many, in recognizing that Scripture makes a clear distinction between the Father and the Son, admit they are separate beings but still cling to the idea that Yahushua is the co-creator and pre-existed in heaven prior to his birth in Bethlehem. Such a notion, though, presents us with a clear contradiction. Yahuwah is one and he alone is the Creator and the only true God. Hear, O Israel, Yahuwah our Elohim, Yahuwah is one. Thus says Yahuwah your Redeemer, and he who formed you from the womb, I am Yahuwah, who makes all things, who stretches out the heavens all alone, who spreads abroad the earth by myself. The denial of this plainly stated truth is largely responsible for the rejection of the gospel by both Jews and Muslims. Yahweh is one. He alone is God. He alone is the Creator. 
The erroneous doctrine of Trinitarians and Binitarians immediately repulses sincere Jews and Muslims because both know that God is one. Consequently, their ears are closed to the life-giving truth as it is in Yahushua, and they are unable to comprehend the glorious gospel of Yahweh's grace and mercy. To be fair, there are many verses that on the surface appear to support the teaching of a pre-incarnate Christ. We must bear in mind, though, that the Bible's translators were not unbiased in their work. They were fallible human beings like you and me, with preconceived notions and inherited traditions, and intentionally or not, their bias shows up in their translations. A prayerful investigation into these supposed proof texts makes clear the fallacy of the Trinitarian and Binitarian doctrines. Much more could be said, but it is our prayer that you, as an honest Bible student and sincere seeker of truth, will prayerfully investigate these things on your own. Time is short, friends. The blasting of the seven trumpets is imminent, and the end of this age is at hand. Yahushua, the man whom Yahweh has ordained to judge the world, will soon return in the clouds of glory to establish Yahweh's everlasting kingdom upon the earth. Don't be found worshipping at the altar of complacency and tradition when he returns. Tear down at once the unbiblical and idolatrous Trinitarian Binitarian doctrine and make your stand on the Bible alone. Choose today whom you will serve. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Yahushua. Praise Yahweh's matchless name now and forever. Amen. For more on this important subject, please visit worldslastchance.com, click on the Content Directory button at the top of the page, and refer to the Trinity Doctrinal Error. You are listening to World's Last Chance Radio on WBCQ at 9330 kHz on the 31 meter band. World's Last Chance Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's soon return. Do you have a best friend? What do you like about him? What first drew you to her? Was it mutual interests? A shared sense of humour? It's easy to think of other humans as friends, but what about the Creator? He's actually the best friend you will ever have. Every positive trait, every friendly personality characteristic that makes a person a good friend is found in the Father. Satan knows that whenever a person gets to know the Father on an individual basis, love always follows. So he's very effectively gotten people to fear the very one who loves them most. To get to know the beautiful character of your Maker, look for the video, Hyawa is the best friend you will ever have, on worldslastchance.com. You can also watch it on YouTube. This is Jane Lamb with your daily promise from Yah's Word. Hebrews 11 has long been called the Faith Hall of Fame chapter. If the book of Hebrews were to be given a modern epilogue, Anne and Adiram Judson would surely be listed in the updated Faith Hall of Fame. The Judsons were among the first Christian missionaries to take the Gospel to Burma. It was an extremely difficult mission field. 
they had been warned that the Buddhists of Burma were impermeable to the gospel message. Part of what made conversions so difficult was a law that decreed converting to another religion was a crime punishable by death. The Judson faith warriors did not let that discourage them. They spent their first three years in Burma immersing themselves in the local language. Anne translated the books of Daniel and Jonah into Burmese, while Adoniram translated the rest of scripture into Burmese. Anne also became the first Protestant to translate any part of the Bible into Thai when she translated the Gospel of Matthew in 1819. The Judsons were wholly committed to living for Yah while sharing truth with those around them. In 1824, war came to Burma. As an English-speaking American, Judson was suspected of spying for Burma's enemy, Great Britain. He was arrested and thrown into a death prison. While there, Adoniram, another missionary and other Westerners, were starved and underwent horrible torture. Of the British prisoners of war interred with them, only one survived. Meanwhile, Anne was left alone as the only Western woman in a country at war with Great Britain. Sick and nursing a newborn infant Adoniram had never even seen, she tirelessly provided food and mats for the prisoners, as well as visited one governmental official after another, seeking her husband's release. It was a time of extreme danger, with untold suffering. One day, a fellow prisoner turned to Adoniram and, with a sneer on his face, asked, Dr Judson, what about the prospect of the conversion of the heathen? Adoniram's immediate reply was, The prospects are just as bright as the promises of Yah. You see, the Judsons trusted the promises of Yah. Like Paul, they could say, I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Psalm 22 verse 24 tells us, He hath not despised, nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither hath he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard. No matter what your difficulties are, Yahweh is right by your side to guide, protect, strengthen and defend. Psalm 55 verse 22 invites us, Cast thy burden upon Yahweh, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. We have been given great and precious promises. Go and start claiming. You are listening to World's Last Chance Radio on WBCQ at 93.30 kilohertz on the 31 meter band. World's Last Chance Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's soon return. Thank you for listening to this episode on WLC Radio. We're living in very solemn times. The world is hovering on the brink of disaster. Catastrophic events will soon take place that will bring this age to a close and usher in the next. In His great mercy, Yahuwah has revealed through prophecy what the future holds. Revelation 8 foretells a series of events, each one worse than the last, that will devastate the earth. The world's food supplies will be decimated 
famine and its accompanying pestilence will result. The Earth's fresh water supplies will also be affected. Revelation 9 reveals that demons will impersonate extraterrestrials. The terror and devastation of this so-called alien invasion will make people desperate for safety at any cost. The freedom to live and worship as the conscience dictates will become a thing of the past. Many lives will be lost during this series of events, and when the mark of the beast is enforced, there will be martyrs. Each event prepares for the next crisis. In one long last call of mercy to repent, for Yahuwah is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Shortly following the events described in Revelation 8 and 9, the seven last plagues will be poured out. These plagues are unprecedented in human history. In a very real sense, these events will empty the earth. Isaiah 24 warns, quote, Behold, Yahuwah maketh the earth empty, and maketh it waste, and turneth it upside down, and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, and shall be removed like a cottage, and the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it, and it shall fall and not rise again." Unquote. For believers, however, there is hope. In describing the end of this age, Yahushua said in Luke 21 verse 28, quote, When these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Unquote. Yes, the end will be traumatic. It's meant to be. Yahuwah wants to save every individual he can, so he allows this final climax to awaken souls. But the gospel of the kingdom of Yah is that, beyond the traumatic events of the near future, an eternity of bliss awaits all who accept Yah's gift of salvation. When Yahushua returns, all who've died trusting in the merits of the crucified and risen Savior will be raised back to life in the first resurrection. Yahushua will then set up Yah's kingdom on earth. He and the redeemed will reign jointly on the earth for the first thousand years of eternity. Since the cataclysmic events preceding Yahushua's return will render the earth uninhabitable, Yahuwah will then recreate a whole new world. John saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. If you wish to join with the redeemed of all ages, living a life that measures with the life of Yahuwah, make the choice. Accept salvation today. You don't have to get yourself ready. The truth is, you can't. Neither can I. No one can. Come to Him just as you are. Don't wait until you've quit sinning. You're not going to get better through your own efforts. Accept Yahuwah's invitation to become a member of His eternal earthly kingdom. When you accept this precious invitation, Yahuwah will gift you with a brand new heart. In Ezekiel 36, verse 26, He declares, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Accepting this priceless gift is the only way for joining his kingdom. Come to Yahuwah just as you are. He's waiting with arms wide open, eager to receive all who come to him. been listening to WLC Radio. 
Join us again tomorrow for another truth-filled message on WBCQ at 93.30 kilohertz on the 31 meter band. World's Last Chance Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's soon return.